Hello. Uh, welcome to the second day of developer sessions at EGX 2017. Thank you very much for coming, and hi to everybody watching online. Uh, coming up in a bit, we'll have sessions on Sunless Skies and Total War Warhammer 2. At 5 o'clock today, our next guest is going to be joined back here, joined in conversation uh, with um, Jake Solomon, designer of the recent XCON games. But first up, let's hear from the man himself, a true authority on turn-based tactical gaming. He virtually wrote the book on the genre, and he's going to talk us through its development on games he worked on, like Laser Squad and the first XCOM, and his latest game, Phoenix Point. Please welcome Julian Gollop. Thanks. Hello. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some very old 8-bit games, um, a bit of a history lesson. Uh, I'll also be talking about my new game, which is Phoenix Point, and how the whole history of Laser Squad, XCOM, and so on, evolved over the years. Um, I think it's very pertinent because somebody asked in Jake Solomon's session yesterday, where did you get the idea of XCOM from? <laughs> so, um, in this session, you will find out exactly where XCOM came from. So, let's get started. So, in the beginning, uh, there were no computer games. I know for most of you, this seems like a really strange idea, but actually, these were the games that I was playing and actually had a, an interesting influence on the development of all my games. Uh, they were very simulation-y, so, for example, Sniper, Squad Leader, all about simulation of um, small squad tactics. Uh, on the science fiction side, Traveler was an amazing RPG. Freedom in a Galaxy, very interesting game where you had both the strategic scale and the tactical scale. You had characters going on individual missions, but you had this whole Star Rebellion thing going on. It was a, basically a Star Wars simulator game. So all this stuff I was playing from maybe 1975 to 1980. Uh, and then I got my Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which of course is the most amazing machine ever invented. And the first thing, um, in, in terms of the origin of where all the XCOM games come from, uh, was this game called Rebel Star Raiders. Uh, it was published in 1984. And the entire game took place in just one screen, and you had like single character um, graphics. It was two players only. But the elements were already there. So this was basically a, a battle between two squads. You turn, it was turn-based, uh, had little firing beams that come out. The terrain was destructible. Um, there was no AI, so it was a very, very basic game. And it was one of the first games that I ever programmed on a computer. And it really showed my very poor programming skills. Uh, however, this was the beginning. And I followed this up a little bit later with a game called Rebel Star 1 and then Rebel Star 2. So uh, one of the things I really wanted to evolve in this game system uh, was a bit more inventory management. So you did have the ability to drop and pick up items. Uh, there's a much better firing algorithm. It's a pixel-perfect line of fire system. You had a much larger map, so it was a scrolling map. Uh, and you had grenades, you could destroy terrain. And one thing in my games which is very, very uh, um, prominent is the ability to destroy the environment. So I don't know why I like that so much, but that's something that was there from the beginning. Um, so Rebel Star 2, which made in 1987, heavily influenced by the film Aliens, which I think was released in the same year. Uh, you're fighting against some aliens, and they have eggs, and they spawn things and stuff. So aliens already coming into it uh, at that stage. So the next big project in this series was Laser Squad, which was released in 1988 on the Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC, then on the Atari ST, Commodore Amiga, and also on PC. So. Uh, with this next step in the evolution, the game system is actually much, much more sophisticated, and there are a lot of elements here which uh, you'll be familiar with in the later XCOM game. Um, in particular, in terms of the game systems, you had facing, a uh, field of vision, uh, morale and stamina are factored into the characters, you had encumbrance, which is how much stuff you carried weighed you down, and how to burden value, manage your inventory. 
Um, you had Overwatch or Opportunity Fire, as I called it. You had the different kinds of shots, automatic shots, snapshots, and aim shots. Um, and actually more sophisticated than even XCOM with the automatic shot, you picked uh, one position and the next position you fired a spread of shots. You could do things like throw something from one character to another and it would catch it. Um, you could even hide grenades in plant pots. Not quite sure why you would be able to do that, but you could do it anyway. Um, you had explosions again, but what was innovative here, that you could have chain reactions of explosions, which was really cool. Um, because you had hidden enemies according to line of sight algorithm. Uh, you had squad equipping, you had armor values and full size. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it's uh, a lot of the actual base mechanics in here, of course, are in the later XCOM. Uh, uh, and you, you know, the tactical side of XCOM is actually not much more sophisticated than what we got in Laser Squad, which is all contained in this tiny 48K memory, which you had on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And really, this was as far as I could really take it on these machines. Um, there were versions made, as I said, for the 16-bit machines. Uh, and on PC, uh, we didn't do the PC version of the game. And we had to think of where do we go from here? And the next game in the series of evolution is actually XCOM itself. But how we actually got there is a very interesting story. So what we did was we made a demo for Laser Squad 2. And it was a demo that we made in the Atari ST. Unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. But it did have the 3D isometric graphics, which um, was actually in XCOM. And it also had the ability to shoot up and down and left and right. It was a full 3D simulation of the environment. But it was just a demo, two-player demo, a very simple demo. But we wanted to find a publisher that could give us the funds to actually do a you know, a real serious evolution of this system. And we wanted to make the game on PC because we saw PC as the main gaming platform of the future. And top of our list of publishers was Microprose. And the reason for that is probably obvious because Microprose made Civilization and Railroad Tycoon. I think Civilization had just come out this year. I think it was 1991. Uh, and we took our demo to Microprose in UK, Chipping Sobri, our little Laser Squad 2 demo. Uh, and the thing about this demo was it not, wasn't very good. I mean, it's very simple. But there was a big fan of Laser Squad at Microprose. His name is Steve Hand, who was a game designer there. And he really wanted to take this project. But they didn't actually really like the demo. Fortunately, the, um, the Microprose UK subsidiary had big ambitions. They wanted a game that would compete with none other than civilization. And the reason for this was that um, Microprose UK was within Microprose organization known as the toy department. Um, and the reason they were called the toy department because they were doing console, small console games. They weren't doing anything big. And they really wanted something that could match civilization. So what they said to us, well, OK, we like Laser Squad, but we want you to have um, a research tech tree like Civilization, and you must have some equivalent of a Civilopedia where you could look at all the stuff that you researched. And I thought, fine, well, how do you squash these two things together? It wasn't very clear at the time. Uh, the next ingredient, which again they added at Microprose UK, was uh, the theme of UFOs. And Steve Han and Pete Moore and other people there were big fans of this series, Jerry Anderson's UFO. And from this TV series, the basic idea of XCOM as an organization is developed. Because in, in UFO, the TV series, you had Shadow. Uh, and what Shadow did was they intercepted UFOs first. They had moon-based interceptors. Then they tried to intercept them uh, with airplanes in the atmosphere. And when the UFOs landed, they had ground-based interceptors. So this obviously made it into XCOM. We, had intercept we didn't have the moon-based interceptions, but we did have air-based interceptions and ground-based interceptions. And we had this idea of XCOM as a worldwide organization that is trying to prevent the infiltration of UFOs onto planet Earth. Now, the only problem with this was that the, the aliens in um, uh, in UFO were a bit boring. They were actually human beings, actually. <laughs> they looked exactly like humans. 
Um, so we needed a, something a lot more interesting as far as the aliens go. Um, so the next, the final ingredient was, uh, all comes from this book, in fact, Alien Liaison by Timothy Good. So in this book, which I bought, I added all this stuff about uh, abductions, cattle mutilations, um, and particularly the idea of reverse engineering captured UFOs. Um, the idea that governments are somehow being manipulated or infiltrated by aliens. There's a lot of talk about the alien greys, which of course featured in, in XCOM. So this was the unusual combination of ingredients which actually made XCOM. But it didn't actually, there was no real game design here. These were just all ideas. These are the stuff that we're going to put together and put into this game. But how does this translate from Laser Squad to, to XCOM? So, uh, the first major idea that I had was to create something which I called the geoscape. So the geoscape is this view of the Earth, uh, rotatey, spinny thing, and you could zoom in and out. And this had different countries in it. The countries were funding XCOM. You could see the UFOs. You could intercept them. It was basically the strategic map of the game. And the interesting thing about this is that the, it ran in real time. There was a day-night cycle, which was brilliantly programmed by my brother, Nick. So it's a very interesting thing, never been done in any game before. Uh, and actually, the simulation of day and night became a sort of major factor in the game itself. So that's one side, the geoscape. Um, and of course, the battlescape, as we called it, is the tactical simulation, which is just basically an evolution of Laser Squad 2. We had new stuff in it. So we had the idea of nighttime missions from the fact that you could be doing a mission at nighttime rather than daytime. Um, and this added a real interesting creepiness, the aliens shooting from the dark, hearing the footsteps of the aliens but not being able to see them, having those bullets come out of the darkness and just killing your guys with one shot, which I'm sure some of you may remember if you played it. It was very irritating. Uh, but it also had fire and smoke and so on and so forth. Um, it was quite simulationly in the, in the way that the game system works. Um, obviously, with the fantasy setting, it was, was really cool. And the Geoscape was, again, very much rooted in a real-world setting. Um, I would have to say that, actually, Geoscape and Battlescape, there are two separate executables, in fact, because the, uh, of the limitations of the PC. We were working within two megabytes of memory. So literally, the geoscape.exe had to load up the battlescape.exe and save some data to disk. Battlescape.exe would load up some data from the geoscape. And after the battle, it will save something and then load up the geoscape.exe. It was a big game. It was a big game in the sense that it was complex, had a lot of complex interacting systems. Uh, it took us three years to do, so it's probably not surprising. Um, and here, is where things start to go slightly wrong. Because after we did XCOM, and XCOM was a fantastic success, uh, it was pirated enormously around the world, <laughs> I have to say, especially in Russia and Eastern Europe, as I discovered later. Um, but after this, so we finished making XCOM. Uh, Microprose wanted to do a, a sequel. Like we actually, I came up with a an idea for a game which was a bit of a Lovecraft with an XCOM system is set in the 1930s. You had to fight these strange cults who were trying to summon aliens from another dimension. Um, and even though it was an XCOM system, it was a very different setting. Um, and as you will see later, the, the Lovecraft emphasis comes back in several ways into Phoenix Point as well. Uh, so. Microprose wanted to do a sequel, and he wanted to, us to do it in six months. And we told him, well, there's absolutely no way that you could do a sequel in six months unless it was basically the same game. So we agreed that they would do the sequel, which became Terror from the Deep. And then we'd work on the next title in the series. And Terror from the Deep, strangely enough, did have some strong Lovecraftian elements. So maybe they took some of my pitch of the Lovecraft XCOM mashup seriously. But we worked on XCOM Apocalypse. Now, the thing with XCOM Apocalypse was that um, we switched from a turn-based system to a real-time system. It was an interesting system. Uh, it didn't 100% work, in my opinion. But um, you have to really realize the context of 
the development of this game that in 1996, everybody on planet Earth was making RTS games. And I remember going to a game developers conference in Santa Clara, and you, somebody would be doing a presentation on pathfinding. I go into the room, and it's absolutely packed with people because everyone wants to know how to do pathfinding because they're all working in RTS games. So this was really the death of turn-based gaming at this stage. Um, the heyday of turn-based gaming is probably from the, you know, the civilization period up to XCOM, and there was also Masters of Orion and Master of Magic, all, both brilliant games. But after that, this grand turn-based strategy game sort of died a death a bit, apart from civilization itself, which, which survived, of course. So um, after this, um, we, we did a deal with Virgin Interactive. We were no longer working for Micropros. Um, during this time, we tried to do a, a sort of a reboot of the original XCOM in a way, which we called Dreamland Chronicles Freedom Ridge. We were working on this in 1999, and we didn't work more than a year on it. Um, and it was, we were making it for PlayStation 2, in fact, as well as PC. So it had a full 3D engine, had a destructible system 3D, had a sort of a geoscape. Um, the control system was a bit weird. It was a lot more of a console-oriented title. You could actually move your characters around in third person with the controller. And when you wanted to shoot something or somebody went into a first-person view, which you can see here. In fact, the way it works is very, very similar to a, a game which came out in 2008 called Valkyria Chronicles on the PlayStation 3, if you're familiar with that. Um, when I played Valkyria Chronicles, I thought, wow, this is exactly, this is really exactly how Dreamland Chronicles worked, at a tactical level anyway. Um, however, the problem with this game is it never saw the light of day. Uh, it's because Virgin Interactive, our publisher, went bankrupt. They basically sold um, all of their stuff to Interplay and then to Titus Interactive and so on. So that was the end of this project. And in fact, that was the end of, of my attempts to, to do anything really xcom in scale. Although I did con continue to do turn-based tactical games with Laser Squad Nemesis, which had an interesting sort of um, phased real-time system. Uh, if any of you have played um, Frozen Synapse, uh, probably more popular than Laser Squad Nemesis, but basically Frozen Synapse is based on the Laser Squad Nemesis system. Uh, they made Rebel Star Tactical Command, which is a game for the GBA, and this, again, was just a series of uh, tactical missions very much based on the original Laser Squad, but on a GBA device. Um, then I went to work for Ubisoft for many, many, many years, uh, which was mostly very unproductive, but I did manage to make something called Ghost Recon Shadow Wars, which is a turn-based tactical game uh, set in the Ghost Recon universe, and was a launch title on the 3DS, and was actually quite a successful launch title, being the second highest rated 3DS title at the time. Um, I wanted to make a sequel for this, but Ubisoft didn't want it. So, Nothing really happened in the, as far as I was concerned, in the evolution of the XCOM style game until this guy came along, Jake Solomon, uh, and his team at Fireaxis, who managed to reboot XCOM with XCOM Enemy Unknown in 2012, which I'm probably sure many of you are very familiar with. So the amazing thing that happened here, and it's really quite remarkable, is this, is this very old turn-based game system was revived and rebooted amazingly successfully um, after many years of struggle uh, by Firaxis uh, and Jake. And it basically proved to me that this genre was not actually dead at all, that there was still a substantial audience for it, which from my point of view is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and it led me to start my own company again after leaving Ubisoft, uh, Snapshot Games. We made a game called Chaos Reborn as our first title, but now we are working on a game called Phoenix Point. On Phoenix Point, we raised $766,000 on fig.co uh, on June this year. Uh, and this has, been, has enabled us to develop the studio and start work on, finally, from my point of view, a game which 
uh, I've been wanting to do for a very long time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Phoenix Point. I'm going to show you a very, very brief demo of the Geoscape side. Um, so what's different about Phoenix Point? What is the evolution of the game system? Well, Phoenix Point has, at a tactical level, it has many things that are familiar for XCOM players. Um, something we've added is um, the ability to target specific body parts on, on enemies, which is a very important part of the tactics. We have some very large monsters in the game. Uh, these are monsters that come out of the mist. They come out from, a, um, from the sea, primarily, initially in the game. And we also have some really, really big monsters. So this, this particular monster, a behemoth, is something that appears on the Geoscape side of the game. And uh, to tackle this, you literally have to land your squad on top of it and deploy poison canisters and take it down before it reaches a haven or a base, destroying it. Uh, we've also got lots and lots of weapons, including a lot of flamethrowers. We've got airborne vehicles. We have also have ground vehicles in the game. Uh, but the setting of Phoenix Point is probably one of the most interesting things because we have created an entire world with our writing team. And actually, if you go to our website, you can read some of the short stories that they've written, uh, some of the really interesting short stories. And it's very much based on a Lovecraftian-style sci-fi horror uh, approach with some interesting twists. Um, but at the start of the game, most of humanity is, is dead. Um, there's an alien virus called the Pandora virus, which has um, basically infested most of the seas. And from the seas come this strange mist, which starts abducting people. And the way it does that is that it makes them walk into the sea. Uh, and then, at the start of the game, the third wave of the mists, there are things coming back out of the sea, which are, in fact, mutated creatures, with, often with human elements. And the aliens just keep mutating as you play the game. So this is the environment that you start in, in Phoenix Point. And you, the player, are the last remnant of an organization called the Phoenix Project. And you have to find out what's happened to the rest of the Phoenix Project. Uh, as well as find a solution to the alien menace. Now, the world of Phoenix Point, there are three main factions, and these are very important aspects of the game. And these factions have been able to take control of many of the remaining isolated pockets of human uh, havens around the world. Uh, you have New Jericho, which is a militarist organization. Uh, they're very much against mutations. You have Synedion, so it's a radical ecology group who want to make a nice new civilization amidst the alien world. And finally, we've got Disciples of Anu, who are a secretive cult that worships a star god. And they are actually uh, able to control mutations themselves. And these three factions vie for power in the world of Phoenix Point. And there's a very dynamic interaction between them, which is very similar to the way some modern 4X games work. Um, I, I'm not going to show you a tactical side of the game. Uh, there are some demos out there which you can watch on this. I, I want to show you some of the latest stuff that I'm uh, currently working on. So one of the interesting things about the whole XCOM genre is the, the fact through all the versions of XCOM, old and new, it's the strategic side that has often been radically the most changed. So on the tactical side, there's been like, just like an evolution. There's been like a development but still the core gameplay is there. On the strategic side, there are, however, big changes. Now, in Phoenix Point, what I'm borrowing from most, probably, is from XCOM Apocalypse. I don't know if any of you have played XCOM Apocalypse, but in, although it was set in a city, it was an environment which was controlled by different corporations who had their own agendas and their own economy, and you could have three-way fights with uh, the police and the aliens and so on. It's an interesting environment, very dynamic, and this is what we want to create in the world of Phoenix Point. So Phoenix Point has the return of the Geoscape, although I'm not actually sure I'm allowed to use that word anymore because it might be copyrighted by Take Two. But anyway, <laughs> we're calling it the Geoscape because that's basically the way that most people are probably familiar with it. Um, so what I'm going to show you is just a very brief early prototype of the exploration system. It gives you an idea of where we're going with it. Uh, let me just 
fired up. Eh, remove the mouse pad. Okay, demo started. So first thing I want to explain, so what it's doing now is running a simulation of the entire world from like 2020 up to the start of the game. These are different factions taking over Haven. So this is Disciples of Anu somewhere else we've got. Okay, is New Jericho and Sinedrin in green. So they, these guys are fighting with each other, developing their Havens. It's running a whole simulation. There's a lot of random elements to this. Um, so this simulation is run up to the start of the game. Now, you may notice that here, this big area here is the alien mist. This is not currently dynamic, but during the course of the game, this mist will be ebbing and flowing across the land. You may also notice that the Earth looks a little bit different. Here is the UK. Most of the eastern side of the UK is underwater because all of the ice caps have been melted. There is nothing left of the ice. It's a very transformed world. Um, the, whole, um, the whole climate and sea levels have all changed. You've only got these very isolated pockets of resistance. So the blue ones are independent havens, red is New Jericho, and so on and so forth. So at the start of the game, you'll just start with a single base. And here we are. You, you know some of the locations around you, but you don't know what they are and you can literally start exploring. And you find you've, okay, if I ended at a neutral haven, get back and refuel. So find a Disciples of Anu haven. Now in this simulation, of course, when you, uh, in the final game, when you actually encounter a haven, there will be some potential tactical encounter with aliens or even the local population. When you encounter a faction, there'll be some diplomatic relations that you have to undertake with them, and you undertake missions for them. So, what we're doing at the start is actually exploring and looking for um, allies, other bases. We're looking for scavenging sites. We can build refueling bases. So let me just put this, turn this bit on. So I go down here. Um, so when I reach here, I'm going to build a refueling base with my supplies. Give me a, extend my range. Um, I can. Let's just change some. So fuel is a, an important factor in the game as well. See Disciples of Anu, and I've got a, a Sinedrian haven here. So these two may be in some conflict. Disciples of Anu and Sinedrian may be having a battle. You may have to side with one of the other factions. Um, you may be able to trade and exchange stuff with them. Uh, if you find, let me just put the cheat on. Is there any? Uh, I'm just looking for another Phoenix base. There's none, none around, actually, unless I go over there. So if I start to extend my range, you notice the day-night cycle is going as well. And it's got the similar time controls as in the original XCOM, which you can speed up and slow down. Uh, as you extend your range, you'll discover some of the inactive Phoenix bases. You'll find new vehicles, and you'll be able to build up your resources. There's a real basic resource system in the game, which is very important for the havens in particular. You've got food at the top. You've got some basic material for building stuff, and you've got high-tech resource here. Um, there will be many special items that you can find. It will have research and manufacturing and so on. So it's a very brief demo of where we're at, just to show you that we are going back to the Geoscape system, but in an entirely new way. So um, that's where we are on um, Phoenix Point. I will be showing, we will be showing a lot more of the game very soon. So I do urge you to follow our development at our website, www.phoenixpointinfo. Um, you can pre-order the game. Some of the, some of the packages that we were giving in our crowdfunding are still available. Um, if you use the code EGX20, you will get a 20% discount for the duration of EGX. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter. I will also be posting a lot of stuff there. And there's a lot more information on the website. You can read the stories by our excellent writing team. You can find out all about the Lovecraftian origins of the game. And now 
I would like to take your questions. If you have anything to ask me, who is going to be the first brave soul to step up to the microphone, which is right here, and I will be happy to answer anything you want to ask. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about your personal approach to game design. Um, it seems you're, you seem to isolate systems, if that's yeah. a fair guess. I just wanted to know what your philosophy was over the years. Yeah, so my approach, as you probably noticed, I tend to be a lot more simulation-y. I like systems which are kind of simulations of things. Um, I also really like systems which are dynamic and interactive, so that basically when the player explores it, um, it's not scripted. Um, in Phoenix Point, you're intervening in a world which is already dynamic. So all these factions are pursuing their own agendas, doing their own stuff. And my, my basic philosophy is that the systems in the game should be interesting enough to the player that he wants to explore it and find different ways to play the game, different solutions. This has always been the main thing that has interested me. Uh, and it's why the strategic layer of Phoenix Point, for example, in particular, is very, very important to me as to how that works. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. 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 Um, um, specifically, the, um, what's it called? The, the destructive part of um, the Battlescape or yeah. whatever it's called. Um, how do you generally balance that in the vein of you don't want, say, the player just completely leveling the map? Well, this is a very good question. Um, I, I would like the player to have the option to completely level the map, but <laughs> there does have to be some downsides to it. So, uh, and particularly in Phoenix Point, is um, a lot of the aliens are more close combat oriented. You actually want the map to be covered with stuff. You don't really want to blow too much up. Um, the other thing is there's also a downside. So if you're inside a haven and you're supposed to be protecting it, you don't want to destroy all their stuff. I mean, I mean you can if you want to, um, but you actually want to protect. You're not just protecting the haven, you're protecting all of its installations, uh, its civilians. So mass distraction is an option, but not maybe, not maybe the best one. So it depends on your objectives, uh, what you want to achieve. Uh, but I say, I, I really do like the player to be able to do it, but there is going to be obviously some downsides to blowing lots of stuff up. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Given the resurgence of turn-based uh, strategy games, do you think that real-time systems like uh, the Laser Squad Nemesis system are a dead end design-wise, or will they move on? Uh, yeah, good question. Now, I, I don't think they're a dead end. I think the problem, the problem with them is, is, is that they just don't have that immediate feedback which you get from a turn-based system. So in a turn-based system, you pick a character, he does something, and you get immediate feedback from that action. You know, he shoots something, moves someone, he spots somewhere. So Laser Squad Nemesis, the problem was is that you're planning for like a 10-second turn ahead, and you don't know actually what's going to happen until you commit to that plan, and then you find it. So it's a very, in a way, it's a very disjointed system. And it doesn't give you that immediate feedback from what you're doing. Um, and it doesn't give you that sort of almost like chess-like calculation that you have to do. In a sense, it's a, it's a different way of thinking about the tactics in a game. Uh, as much as I love Laser Squad Nemesis, I thought it was a fantastic game, uh, I think it's less accessible to, to many players. It doesn't have that immediate feedback, which, which, is, which is really interesting. So I, I guess I still prefer the more straightforward turn-based approach. Did you experiment with uh, shorter turns, like two seconds or five seconds, like frozen signups? Shorter turns, yeah, but you still got to manage. You still, even then, it gets more disjointed because you're, if you have to give like a two-turn turn for all of your squad, it's the micromanagement gets very gets in the way of the actual gameplay. If you see what I mean. Thank you. 
Hi, Julian. Uh, nice T-shirt. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, as a fan of your games and of uh, Lovecraft, could you elaborate a bit further on which aspects of the Lovecraft mythos have influenced Phoenix Point? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, one of the obvious things is one of Lovecraft's obsession with miscegenation, this combination of human uh, and sea creatures, which you'll find in like Dagon and Shadow Over in Smith, these kind of stories. Um, there's also most strong elements from his stories like At the Mountains of Madness about alien species which are very alien that have been on Earth for a long time, for example. Um, there is also um, in particular in Disciples of Anno, this idea of this human cult that is worshipping the aliens and somehow they've got some connection with it. It's a very important part of the story in Phoenix Point. Uh, there's more that connects to Lovecraft ideas, but I can't divulge it right now, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, hi, I was wondering um, which turn-based games that aren't, you know, by you or derived from your games, do you really admire? Or are they all crap compared to you, the master? Oh, <laughs> no, well, thanks. Um, surprisingly, I, I'm very critical of turn-based games in general. Um, the ones that I have played a lot, I'm afraid to say, are um, Advanced Wars on the GBA, um, Fire Emblem, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, many of those games which are around on the consoles, which are the Japanese JRPG style, Disc Gear. <laughs> Strangely, a lot of that stuff is the kind of things that I played. Um, and uh, I don't know why, but I found, uh, particularly found those style of games really appealing. And in a, in a way, they're quite similar to XCOM because you're, you're actually dealing with a squad of characters that you're trying to improve and level up. And particularly Fire Emblem, I really related to because of its vicious permadeath <laughs> situation. Um, but these are the games that I've, I've, I've really admired and played a lot, I guess, over the last 15, 20 years. Thanks. All right, uh, it looks like that's a wrap. So uh, please give a big hand to Julian Gollop. Thank you much. And thank you.